All right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Yelena Bagdasarian, and I am a senior McConnell Scholar majoring in public health and political science. As part of our year-long project on Alexis de Tocqueville and Origins and Democracy in America, I welcome you to follow our lecture and podcast series at mcconnellcenter.org. It is my honor today to introduce Dr. Sheehan, who will be leading our lecture and seminar on why associations matter. Dr. Sheehan is an assistant professor of political science at Dukensi University and a non-resident scholar at the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania. He researches the intersection of First Amendment rights and political theory. Sheehan's scholarly articles and reviews have appeared in the Political Science Reviewer, Humanitas, Anemius, and the Journal of Value Inquiry, and he has lectured widely on religious liberty, freedom of speech, and freedom of association. His book, Why Associations Matter, The Case for First Amendment Pluralism, was published by the University Press of Kansas. He is writing a second book tentatively titled Freedoms Like a Fox, Liberalism, Pluralism, and the First Amendment. From 2018 to 2019, Sheehan was Associate Director and Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Freedom Project at Wellesley College, and from 2016 to 2018, Sheehan was a Postdoctoral Associate in the Department of Political Science at Duke University. He received a PhD and Master's in Political Theory from Catholic University of America and a BS in Political Science from the Honors College at Oregon State University. He is a five-time recipient of the Humane Studies Fellowship from the Institute for Humane Studies, a 2014 recipient of the Richard M. Weaver Fellowship from the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and a 2018 recipient of the Leonard P. Ligio Memorial Fellowship. Without further ado, everyone, please welcome Dr. Sheehan. Thank you. It's good to, uh, to be here with you all. Uh, as you probably know, the McConnell Center has a national reputation, so it's quite an honor to be present on campus and speaking with all of you. So I'm going to be talking about freedom of association. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, some readings that you have done uh, for today uh, in Alexis de Tocqueville. As you know, he was a great admirer of freedom of association and the art of association. And we'll talk a little bit about why. And then I'll get into some problems that I see in the freedom of association jurisprudence as the Supreme Court has given it to us, and some ways in which I think we can uh, insert a little more Tocqueville into the court's jurisprudence. So Alexis de Tocqueville observed that it's the dawning of a democratic age, and he thinks, as you know, that uh, this democratic age has been a long time coming. It's been slowly, equality has slowly worked its way through over the last maybe thousand years, and really coming into uh, fruition in the 18th and 19th centuries. He's writing, of course, in the early to mid 19th century. And he's especially concerned with the relationship between liberty and equality. He doesn't think they're a necessary contradiction, uh, but they can be in tension and possible contradiction, depending upon how it plays out, of course. Uh, and he's, he's, what he's worried about is um, equality can, as beneficial as it is, it can be a passion, or it can cause a passion. And he means this in the classical sense. Passions are not a good thing in the classical world. They cause you to do rash and foolish things. He says, democratic peoples have a natural taste for liberty. Left to themselves, they seek it, they love it, and it is only with pain that they see themselves separated from it. But they have an ardent, insatiable, eternal, invincible passion for equality. They want equality and liberty, and if they cannot obtain that, they still want equality and slavery. They will suffer poverty, enslavement, barbarism, but they will not suffer aristocracy. So this is the way in which equality, as beneficial as it is, and uh, as ineradicable as it is in our own age, can be a way in which despotism comes about. Uh, one way in which equality, or a passion for equality, can bring about despotism is it's not so much that it might be too much to say it sows the seeds of despotism as it tills the field of despotism. And the way it does this is it alienates people from each other. So the thing about an aristocracy is inequality is built into an arist aristocratic system. But that very inequality creates a community, this great chain of being from the peasants through the aristocracy up to the king. And so everyone's united. Whatever problems there are with aristocracy, and there are plenty, as people have pointed out over the centuries, it does do that. It does create a community. The problem with democracy and the equality it brings is that it brings alienation. So uh, it separates, he says, 
people from their ancestors. Aristocrats are very concerned with their ancestors. So when they uh, think of the, uh, the manors in England where they, <laughs> the ancestors are up there on the wall going back and back and back. Um, that was true in aristocracies at all times. The Romans did the same thing, had busts, uh, funeral masks on their mantle going back and back and back. And they keep the candles lit. Um, Democrats don't do that. So they get cut off from their ancestors. That means they also get cut off from their descendants. Um, so they see themselves as just a single generation, even a single person. Um, so people tend to look inward in equality. So it separates them from their ancestors, from their descendants, and also from each other. Um, it doesn't necessarily turn them against each other, but it separates them. We're all just equals. That is, we're all just kind of a sea of atoms floating about. What's the connection we have with each other? Not much. Aristocracy at least gave us connection to each other. Um, whatever abuses might come along with that system or dangers. Um, so equality creates alienation, and then alienation sows the field for despotism. So he says, democratic peoples have got to figure out another way in which they can have a community. Obviously, it's not going to be through some hierarchy of aristocracy. It's got to be some other way. Fortunately, he's thrilled. Uh, as you know, he's very concerned that this democratic age is not going to pan out. Uh, as we all might hope. But he sees a glimmer of hope, maybe more than a glimmer of hope, in associations, ways in which a democratic people who are equal form communities anyway, attach themselves to each other anyway. He writes, there's only one nation on earth where the unlimited liberty of, associate, of associating for political ends is used daily. The same nation is the only one in the world where the citizens have imagined making continual use of the right of association in civil life and have succeeded in gaining in this way all the good things civilization can offer. Speaking, of course, of, uh, of America. And he further writes, Americans of all ages, of all conditions, of all minds constantly unite. Not only do they have commercial and industrial associations in which they all take part, but also they have a thousand other kinds. Religious, moral, intellectual, serious ones, useless ones, very general and very particular ones, immense and very small ones. Americans associate to celebrate holidays, establish seminaries, build inns, erect churches, distribute books, send missionaries to the antipodes. In this way, they create hospitals, prisons, schools. If finally it is a matter of bringing a truth to light or of developing a sentiment with the support of good example, they associate. Wherever, this is the key part, wherever at the head of a new undertaking, you see in France the government, and in England, a great lord, count on seeing in the United States an association. So associations can set a common goal, and they can move a whole group of people towards it, who are equals, who aren't being forced to go in that direction, but they are compelled through their association to go in that direction. So you go to England, the aristocrats, the great aristocrats are doing everything. There's a leak in the roof of the local church. The pastor goes to the, uh, the priest, goes to the royal aristocrat, tells him, he puts on a new roof, he sends his guys down, puts on a new roof. Um, the road is getting bad and the merchants can't make it in the market. They tell the local lord, he goes and fixes the road. And on and on and on, the aristocrats do this. And they can, they have, this, they have the manor, they've got people who work for them. Um, they, can, they can make things happen. I mean, even today, um, there's stories of the local aristocrat who somebody can't, doesn't have a car and can't get to the hospital. He sends his car over and takes him to the hospital. Now, you know, these are the sorts of things, noblesse oblige. This is what aristocrats do. What do you do when you don't have any aristocrats? That's what we had to figure out in a democracy. Um, how can you get people to work together anyway? So he sees that Americans, there's a leak in the roof, an association forms. And they talk about how they're going to raise funds for it, pay for it, and who's going to go about executing it, the executive power that will actually carry out what they decide. And they do it through associations. Voluntary associations, they fix potholes, they found seminaries, they start schools, they fix churches. Uh, they do all of these things. And as this whole paragraph is kind of marvelous, every possible thing, really grand things and really banal things. Uh, in fact, it's been a, a bit of a running joke from at least the 1790s of these associations that form for rather silly purposes. You know, playing music or playing cards. Interestingly enough, Paul Revere started a bell ringing society that would ring bells for two hours a week in the 1750s. Uh, so these sorts of things, sometimes very useless. And then uh, associations formed to kind of mock these associations. The association of uh, you know, um, anti-bell ringers and such also arose. Uh, but Americans do kind of everything uh, through these associations. And he says, here it is. Aristocracies can last for centuries because of the way they can build community. Democracies, maybe, maybe, he's not sure yet. Maybe they can last for centuries too. 
insofar as the acts of association are free and vibrant. They're happening. Which brings us to America. So, thesis of my book is, well, one of the theses, freedom of association is no longer recognized in First Amendment jurisprudence, certainly not to the extent that it ought to be. So as you know, the First Amendment lists off five freedoms. Some critics point out that one of them is not the freedom of association. Uh, so we've got religious liberty, the establishment and the free exercise clause, kind of together is religious liberty, speech clause, press clause, assembly clause, and that's where associations ought to reside, and the petition clause. Now often these rights are described as expressive freedoms. What does the First Amendment do for us? Uh, well, it protects our expressive rights. Um, it's true as far as, it go, as, as far as it goes, it's just not exhaustive. And what it leaves out turns out to be pretty important. Um, so think of religious liberty. It's much more than just proselytizing or religious speech. It's much more that goes into the free exercise clause. The court's been pretty good on that. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press, of course, all are expressive rights. But then there's this curious right of the people peaceably to assemble, which drops out of the court's jurisprudence. The court never does much with it, but it hasn't really mentioned it in some 40 years. It sat there largely dormant. Even before then, it didn't do much with it since the 1940s. And then we have the petition uh, for redress of grievances. If we have time in the Q&A, I'll give you my spiel on that one. Very important freedom, as it turns out. Now, the court, as I said, doesn't do much with associational freedom. So uh, the court, in fact, doesn't even use that term until 1958 in um, NAACP versus Alabama, where the court rightly rules that the, um, that the NAACP does not have to turn over its membership list to the state of Alabama, who had forbidden the organization from operating there unless it turned over its membership list. The court says, um, as part of your freedom of association, don't have to turn over the membership list. The court says this. Freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas is an inseparable aspect of the liberty assured by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Notice not the First Amendment. The court says it's a liberty in the 14th Amendment. Funny, funny uh, story here. It's because one of the justices refused to sign onto the opinion, which they wanted to be unanimous, unless they cited the 14th Amendment instead of the First Amendment. The rest of the justices wanted to go to the first, but it ended up being one of those funny backstories of why we get the uh, the argument that we do. Court goes on. Effective advocacy of both public and private points of view, particularly controversial ones, is undeniably enhanced by group association, as this court is more than once recognized by remarking upon the close nexus between the freedoms of speech and assembly. So mentioning two First Amendment freedoms, not citing to the First Amendment, um, saying these reside in the 14th Amendment. Um, but notice the connection the court makes between assembly or association and the importance of association in speech. Well, what are you doing? Well, they're advocating ideas. That's important. We've got a democratic society. Got to have advocacy for ideas. True as far as it goes. But what it doesn't say is anything about associations as protected in their own right, as an assembly clause uh, analysis might have done. Bates versus City of Little Rock, 1960, same thing, um, an attempt to um, insist that the NAACP turn over its membership list. Court, again, rules for the NAACP. And the court connects association to advancing ideas and airing grievances. So again, connecting association. You have a freedom of association insofar as you're protecting free speech or exercising free speech. Shelton versus Tucker, same year. Uh, requirement that a teacher disclose uh, it, um, his memberships. Um, the court writes, to compel a teacher to disclose his every associational tie is to impair that teacher's right of free association a right closely allied to freedom of speech and a right which, like free speech, lies at the foundation of a free society. Again, close connection between speech and association. Ruling rightly, I'd say, um, in all of these cases, but the reasoning of the court, it's not giving us a firm grounding um, in association, giving us an explanation for what it is jurisprudentially and what it is textually and what it is in the Constitution as such. Louisiana versus NAACP, 1961. Um, here the court struck down a law that required the disclosure of membership lists, um, citing finally to the First Amendment, but also um, insisting that association is a speech right or so closely associated with the right to free speech. And then finally in NAACP versus Button, 1963, uh, the court strikes down a Virginia statute uh, that bans improper solicitation. 
uh, because, the court writes, the banned activities were modes of expression and association protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendments, which Virginia may not prohibit. So we got 5-0. and oh. The NAACP wins in five years um, in the court ruling for freedom of association, but in its reasoning, it's not giving it a good, firm, independent grounding, um, implying that it's the speech clause is where freedom of association comes from, which means your associational rights are important or protected insofar as they're expressive in some way. Fast forward a couple decades. Roberts versus J.C.'s, 1984. Um, so in this case, the details of this case get a little complicated, but uh, JC's was an organization that sought to advance uh, young men in business. So to be a member, you had to be, I think, under the age of 35 and male. To be an associate member, you could be uh, well older than 35 and male, or a, a woman could be associate members. Um, There's rather complicated ord city ordinance in St. Paul, and the national organization got in a fight with a local association, all rather complicated. Um, gets up to the Supreme Court, though. The court rules against the group. Um, the ruling's less important than what the court says. So here's what the court says. This is good for freedom of association, then it gets bad. There can be no clear example of an intrusion into the internal structure or affairs of an association than a regulation that forces the group to accept members it does not desire. Such a regulation may impair the ability of the original members to express only those views that brought them together. Freedom of association, therefore, plainly presupposes a freedom not to associate. Then the court coins a term expressive association. So what is your associational right? It's expressive association. That's the right you have in the First Amendment, the court says. Um, so the way the court kind of draws this out, it says you have two types of freedom of association guaranteed by the Constitution. You have the right of intimate association. That's uh, right to family and family-like structures. Um, the court kind of absorbs that into its privacy jurisprudence. And you have freedom of expressive association when you're expressing viewpoints of some sort through your associations. The court goes on, Hurley versus Irish American uh, Gay and Lesbian Group of Boston. Again, it upholds associational rights on free speech grounds. So this had to do with the organizers of a parade and what floats were going to be in the parade. The court says the organizers of the parade, as part of their expressive association, decide which floats are in the parade. Again, close connection between speech and association. Boy Scouts versus Dale in 2000. Uh, the court writes there, the forced inclusion of an unwanted person in a group infringes the group's freedom of expressive association if the presence of that person affects in a significant way the group's ability to advocate public or private viewpoints. So again, have the freedom of association in an association insofar as speech is implicated. All right. Now the court mostly is ruling for the group. So pushback I always get is, well, it seems like freedom of association is okay, even if I quibble over the reasoning, because the groups are winning. Um, so they tend to win uh, until they don't. But this is a weak, a weak argument the court's kind of giving us. And it starts off with the NAACP cases. It's actually a little vague on exactly what the connection is between association and speech. The court says there is one. Um, and then the court in 1984 coins a term. So the term for the associational freedom we have is expressive association. There's not a separate term for it for the court. Which brings us to Christian Legal Society versus Martinez in 2010. So here, the court uh, rules against the association. So the details of the case here. Um, Christian Legal Society is a student group at a public law school in California, Hastings College of the Law. And it had a co group constitution, as it was required to by the, uh, by the uh, student organization forum. Um, that had a statement of faith in it, it was a religious group, um, and membership requirements, like all of every single group does, um, around its, this particular group, around its, uh, basically it was an evangelical student group. Um, so you would recognize it as, you know, statement of faith, is, you know, believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, um, and so on. Um, so it had this, um, and it was rejected. Its membership was rejected because it was going to require its leaders and voting members to be Christian, as part of the Christian Legal Society. So there's a lawsuit, um, and they sue, um, they sue under free speech, expressive association, and free exercise. Uh, the court actually dismisses the free exercise claim in a footnote, which is concerning in itself, uh, but we won't get into that. Um, and then it combines the free speech and expressive association claims. So the court writes, CLS's expressive association and free speech arguments merge. Who speaks on its behalf, CLS reasons, colors what concept is conveyed, and therefore makes little sense to treat CLS's speech and association claims is discrete. So it fully caps, uh, collapses 
associational concerns into speech explicitly. Uh, and I see this, I see kind of the, the underlying theoretical framework that the court's working here is, I call it the First Amendment dichotomy. So when the court wants to make an argument about the importance of freedom of association, it'll make an argument based upon its conception of an individual or its conception of the democratic state. So what that means is, why do we have free speech protections? Well, it's important for us as individuals to be able to uh, speak and communicate with our fellow citizens as individuals. Um, and in fact, it's uh, kind of the quintessential individual rights. You can literally stand on a soapbox by yourself and speak. Um, and that's kind of the, actually the image that we generally use when talking about speech rights. And the idea of the democratic state is, um, insofar as freedoms are important, they're important because they encourage a democracy. So why do we have free speech and strong free speech protections? Well, in a democracy, we gotta talk to each other as citizens. Um, this argument goes back at least to Madison in the 1790s. Um, recognizing a republic is unique in needing this freedom. Um, so far, so good. Now, what that leaves out is the association. So this is how the court's reasoning plays out in this First Amendment dichotomy. Um, so the, the collapse of freedom of association into freedom of speech. The court says we, there's no reason we would consider separate analyses for association and speech. They're the same thing. Um, so the court says you have freedom of association insofar as it amplifies your speech. But if you think about it, the court says, if a dissenting member joins your group, that doesn't affect your speech rights. You can still say anything you want. So why would it possibly matter if we force a Christian group to, to have non-Christian leaders and non-Christian voting members? It's not gonna affect your speech. You can say anything you want still. In fact, the court goes on to say, might even encourage speech because we're talking more to each other and to people who disagree. So this is part of the individualization um, that kind of sidelines associations. It's only going to make an analysis insofar as the individual right to free speech is there. And it apparently is unclear how a dissenting member would ever violate your speech rights. You can, of course, still speak no matter who shows up to your meetings or no matter who the president of the group is. You can still speak. Um, there's no way an associational analysis will make kind of has any place in the court's analysis after CLS versus Martinez, if the court sticks with it. The court also, um, kind of in line with the individualization of associations, dismantles the status belief distinction. Uh, so the court had traditionally understood um, a distinction between beliefs you might have and your status. So um, race and sex are status. So if you discriminate on the basis of race and sex, that might be a problem. Um, but if you discriminate on the basis of belief, like whether or not you're a Christian, uh, for example, or what your statement of faith is, or whether or not you wanna play soccer uh, or something like that, that's okay. Just not on the basis of status. The court has made this distinction. Um, and the court uh, collapses that. Um, so uh, the court writes, whether a student organization, uh, the court says, uh, kind of explaining why it's okay uh, for the um, university to require every group to admit any person, even if they disagree with the purpose of the organization, um, uh, the court writes that the university can be concerned whether a student organization cloaked prohibited status exclusion and belief-based garb. So you say, well, um, you're not a Christian, and the school might say, well, there might be status, some status distinction under there, lurking under there somehow. Um, and then finally, on the individual side, the court's use of reasonable and viewpoint neutral, which are fairly standard legal standards um, in terms of treating these things. Uh, the court writes, CLS's analytical error lies in focusing on the benefits it must forego, so it doesn't get to be on campus, while ignoring the interest of those it seeks to fence out. Exclusion, after all, has two sides. Hastings, the law college, caught in the crossfire between a group's desire to exclude and students' demand for equal access may reasonably draw a line in the sand permitting all organizations to express what they wish, but no group to discriminate in membership. Um, so the court's analysis focus exclusively on accommodating an individual's desire to join a group. You're not a Christian, but you wanna join CLS versus Martinez anyway for some reason. Um, and the court says, well, that's a reasonable demand. Um, and the court says this is viewpoint neutral because every group's gonna be forced to admit people who might disagree with them. So the, copper, uh, the soccer club is gonna to have to let people who wanna play basketball join. Democrats can be forced to admit Republicans and vice versa. Muslims have to let Christians in. Christians have to let Muslims in. You see, viewpoint neutral. Everyone lost their freedom of association. So no problem. Uh, so the court here will only give an individual analysis insofar as an individual wants to join. 
insofar as an individual's speech rights are threatened. And as I said, um, it doesn't implicate really association at all. State, the second part of the First Amendment dichotomy. So we got a public university, Hastings College of the Law. The court has said for a very long time that First Amendment rights apply at public universities. Um, so the public university is basically an extension of the state. Now what the court does in this case is it sees any activities by an organization, such as CLS, is basically taking place within the context um, of the state as if it's an appendage to the state. And they can't imagine there being another category. Um, so here's what the court says. Uh, the First Amendment shields CLS against state prohibition of the organization's expressive activity, however exclusionary that activity may be. But CLS enjoys no constitutional right to state subvention of its selectivity. Um, so what the court says here is um, democratic speech is very important, so the public university has an interest in encouraging that, and by forcing organizations to permit dissenting members to join, it's encouraging debate. It's which is exactly what our democracy needs. Um, so it's using CLS to kind of advance state prerogatives of democracy by using the CLS organization to bring uh, opposing views together. The court also goes on um, to in its state property and state action analysis. Again, extending those concepts, not just the university, but to the private organization. So the court's forum analysis is uh, has been a mess for a long time. But basically the way it works is there's three categories. Uh, the court will say um, there's traditional public forums. This is like sidewalks and public parks are quintessential examples. So it's public property, but First Amendment rights are fully present. The government has almost no authority to censor or discriminate between viewpoints there. Then there's non-public forums. And this is where the government's advancing its own prerogatives. And you basically have no free speech rights there. Um, government's trying to accomplish its own goals. And then there's a middle category, limited public forums or designated public forums. So these are where the state doesn't have to create this forum, but once it does, First Amendment rights are fully present. Um, the classic example are student organization forums at public universities. The court has said this is a limited public forum. Public universities don't have to create them, but if they do, they have to provide First Amendment rights in those forums. Um, what the court says here is, well, no, seeing how the state university has created this forum, it gets to determine the rules of that forum, which is partially true. So for example, a student organization forum can be limited to students at that university. That's a reasonable, reasonable limitation. Um, but the court's forum analysis goes further. It says actually the state gets to determine who enters that forum and on what, on what grounds. Along these analysis, the court also says, um, well, what we're talking about here is government property, state university, the state owns it, um, the state can then permit or not permit people to go onto it and what they do there, determine what they do there. Um, furthermore, if you are using classroom space and you're getting student fee funding to buy your, you know, sodas or hamburgers or whatever, um, well, that's a subsidy. And therefore, the state gets determined through a subsidy how it's used and for what groups and for what purposes and that sort of thing. So using this analysis, um, then obviously uh, CLS, uh, the university can determine what CLS does. Um, so basically the, universe, or the courts ignoring that there are some distinctions here. Um, there's a very big difference between public property, like a public park, First Amendment rights are fully present, and the Pentagon, where they're not. Very big distinction between those types of government property. And so what, when the CLS is using classroom space or the, the campus green, what type of property are we really talking about here in a limited public forum? And as far as a subsidy goes, the court has said repeatedly, there's kind of two types of subsidies. There's ones where the government's doing something. Um, it's trying to fund a particular thing, a particular activity. And then there's funding that's encouraging a broad away, array of views and activities. So think of the difference between you know, a contract where the government has kind of full control on what the contractual obligations are, and uh, the court has called tax exemption status a subsidy. I could quibble with that, but We'll go with it. Um, that's very different. The court's not allowed, or the government's not allowed to discriminate against uh, these groups. It's not allowed to tell them what to do with their tax exemption status because it gives them tax exemption status for the most part. So it can't decide that Christian legal, or uh, you know, Christian church doesn't get tax exemption status unless it. Government's not allowed to do that. Um, so the court's property and subsidy analysis also kind of lets the state subsume kind of everything within its purview. And finally, a 14th Amendment analysis. So the court says, 
um, that there's a problem with CLS versus Martinez because it has this requirement. It's an evangelical student group, and it's a requirement regarding sexual activity, um, which um, has to cohere with traditional Christian values. The court says, well, the state can't do that. Because um, you see the states, we have all these opinions, Romans, Romer versus Evans, Lawrence versus Texas, and so on, where the state cannot discriminate in that way. Um, and one concurrence even writes regarding uh, why CLS has to get rid of its statement of faith, the era of loyalty oaths is behind us. Drawing an analogy between the state having a loyalty oath and a Christian student group having a loyalty oath. As if these are the same thing. So the state's concept of the state is subsuming the group into it. So why can't Christian legal society require its group to be Christians? Because the government can't require people to be Christians. And the court just draws that analogy uh, between the two. And finally, uh, the exercise of private authority. Um, so the court writes, the law school's policy aims at the act of rejecting would-be group members without reference to the reasons motivating that behavior. CLS's conduct, not its Christian perspective, is from Hastings' vantage point, what stands between the group and RSO status. So that is, the group can still profess Christianity, it just cannot make its voting members and its leaders Christian, the, the, the court says. And it's okay for a public entity to insist upon that, that private groups adopt the state strictures for themselves. Uh, so in this way, I think the court, uh, kind of the entirety of the arguments they make and the reasoning in CLS versus Martinez misses something fairly important when we're talking about a group like CLS versus Martinez, and that is the association. It's left entirely out of the analysis. What about, we're not talking about the state, we're talking about the association. We're not talking about the individual right to free speech, we're talking about the association. Um, what about that? Um, and it's entirely absent um, from the court's analysis. Uh, so a couple of figures might be helpful in us sorting through this. One is Tocqueville, and one is Tocqueville's greatest 20th century disciple, Robert Nisbet, uh, the sociologist. Um, who wrote a very famous book called Quest for Community in 1953, um, and then 20 more books that more or less expanded on that thesis. Um, he does a very good job of explaining how some of these arguments that show up in the court's analysis, namely of dichotomizing every judicial and political concern into the individual and the state, tends to downplay um, the role of associations and make them somewhat uh, disappear from our, from our legal uh, legal site. And so I think what we need is a way in which we can describe these things, these associations that Tocqueville thought was so important. Um, so, and, and Nisbet does that for us. And he says every association or every community has seven qualities. The first is uh, a, a, a function. So that is every group does something. Christian Legal Society brings together Christian law students at Hastings Law School. Soccer club brings together people who want to play soccer on Wednesday nights. First thing, so function. Second thing is a dogma. And what a dogma is, is a sense of some transcending purpose. Um, so it's not just that you do something, it's that what you're doing is good and valuable. Maybe the most valuable thing out there. So for CLS, it's being a Christian and being a lawyer and being a Christian lawyer. And that's, there's a transcending purpose to that. If you're playing soccer at a soccer club, playing soccer is good, that would be your dogma. This must be a worthwhile thing to do. Um, we can think of it as central tenets would be another way of, of putting it. And then other aspects of a community. So those are the first two most important. Authority, the ability, the ability to be able to accomplish your function. You have to exert authority. Tell people, show up on Wednesday nights. You know, that's an exercise of authority. There's a hierarchy. There's going to be a group members and then voting members and president and vice president and secretary. You know this. All those things. So that is um, status and role and function, hierarchy among these. Solidarity, every community has a sense of we in it. Status, everyone gets something from the group, a sense of status. This can be very, very marginal. I'm a Christian lawyer, I joined the Christian lawyer group um, and I have a status, that's what I am. Um, so this is beyond material and utilitarian interest. I'm, I believe in this and I'm part of it. And then finally, a sense of superiority. And what that just means is simply is this is worthwhile I have nothing better to do on Wednesday nights than this. This is the best thing I can be doing right now. But a sense that this community matters for some reason. Um, so that need not be nefarious, um, but just a sense that this must be valuable or you wouldn't be there and you wouldn't be a part of it. So we have these seven qualities. The question is, how might we kind of translate these into, um, 
into our jurisprudence. Uh, Robert Nisbet um, sketches out a way in which that can be done. So he gives us four principles of pluralism as he describes them. And they are functional autonomy. So every group has a function. They ought to be autonomous as much as possible to fulfill that function. So a simple, simple principle. Second principle, decentralization. As much as possible, you want to decentralize functions and powers that might have accrued to the center in some way, send them back out to the periphery. Uh, third, hierarchy. Embrace the fact that there's a difference of role and function. Uh, it's how everything happens. Universities love to talk a good game about equality, but look at the website. You got a president, you got a provost, you got a dean, you got associate dean, you have directors and assistant directors, you have full professor, associate professors, assistant professors, associate teaching professors, assistant teaching professors, adjuncts, etc. This is a hierarchy. Uh, so stratification of role and function. That's what these things are. Um, and that's why things work, is when you have those things out. You have to have those things. Um, just recognize that. That's, and authority has to be exercised through that. And then finally, tradition. Um, and what Nisbet means by that is the reliance upon the largest possible measure, not formal law, ordinance, or administrative regulation, but use and want. The uncalculated but effective mechanisms of the social order, custom, folkway, and all the uncountable means of adaptation by which human beings have proved so often to be masters of their destinies and wage governments cannot even comprehend. What he means here is think small t tradition with the, in the plural, traditions, things your group does. Every group has these. Um, they're not, they can be really important to the group and opaque from the outside. So why is it so important to have this particular tradition? From the outside, it can seem completely inconsequential. So just as an example, think of certain religious traditions and the need for facial hair. Um, why do those religious traditions have that need? From the outside, it's opaque. How can it possibly be theologically important? Um, that doesn't matter. What matters is internally, why is it theologically important to those people um, as part of their traditions? Um, so uh, you don't want to interfere as much as possible with traditions from the outside because you don't know how important they are to the inner functioning of that particular group. So I think what we could do is take Robert Nisbet's um, principles of pluralism and translate them into a judicial test. So as you probably know, Supreme Court, when it's dealing with a problem, it likes to come up with a legal test. So here's what we'll do. We'll ask these three or four questions and that'll tell us whether or not a right was violated. So here's what we might do. I call it the functional autonomy test after Nisbet's first principle of functional autonomy. First question. Does the policy inhibit the functional autonomy of the group? That's the first thing we'd ask. The answer is yes. Um, then we would want a very good reason for why the government, uh, the government is permitted to do this. Um, so uh, we would call it strict scrutiny. It has to be a high standard for a state, uh, a state entity, including a public university, messing with the associational freedom of a group in some way. And then second, does the policy inappropriately interfere with the traditions of a group? So is it putting some restrictions that seem ephemeral? It's telling the group not to wear something or to shave or something like that. Is this inappropriate? Is this really necessary? Um, and what we'd want is strict scrutiny. So that is, um, the government has to have a compelling interest and the means have to be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Uh, before you mess with the inner workings of a group, you better have a good reason to do so. So the functional autonomy test, the federal judiciary could bring this to bear. Legislatures could also bring something similar to bear. Uh, so I've drafted the Freedom of Association Protection Act, modeled after the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, that would direct the, um, the, either the federal judiciary or state uh, judiciaries, depending on who passed it, um, to first of all, locate the freedom of association, not in the speech clause, but in the assembly clause, which the court has not done much with. Um, and then require, it, require courts to use the functional autonomy test. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act does something similar. Requires a particular test regarding free exercise of religion to be used by the courts. And then requires strict scrutiny by the courts as well. So in this way, I think, uh, I think we could get back to something like Tocqueville's, what Tocqueville envisioned as protection for associations. As you might recall in the readings that uh, we all did for today, one thing he, he, an idea he gets at that he doesn't quite use this term, but he's worried about the chilling effect on freedom of association or associational actions. He said, if you start to restrict associations, the problem is it never stops where you think it's gonna stop. There's a chilling effect. People start thinking, if they can get in trouble for this, I probably ought not to do these things too. That's just kind of how it works. 
Um, so the court has defined a chilling effect on regulations as also unconstitutional. Um, so we would be very hesitant to have any restrictions upon freedom of association for that reason. We wouldn't want the chilling effect that Tocqueville senses could be a real problem and start to suppress these associations that are absolutely necessary if a democracy is to remain a liberal democracy. Right, thank you.